So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links at my Instagram account under Robin underscore Norgren and over on at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with some words from Chris Gillibo on the happiness of pursuit. People have always been captivated by quests. History's earliest stories tell of epic journeys and grand adventures. Whether the history is African, Asian, or European, the plot line is the same. A hero sets off in search of something elusive that has the power to change both their life and the world. In the Judeo-Christian story of creation, Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden of Eden and sent to toil the earth. In the Buddhist story, the question of practice and struggle is emphasized over creation. Sacred texts skip straight to the quest toward enlightenment. The world's best-known literature reflects our desire to hear about struggle and sacrifice in pursuit of a goal. From Aesop's fables to Arabian Nights, many classic stories are about adventure and quests. Shakespeare keeps us enthralled with the quest stories of shipwrecks and mistaken identity. Sometimes all was well that ended well, but sometimes tragedy followed as the natural consequence of a flawed character's poor decisions. In modern times, Hollywood knows that quests are an easy sell. Consider the blockbuster franchises Star Wars, Star Trek, Indiana Jones, and countless others. The tougher the odds and the higher the stakes, the better, as long as the audience has something to believe in. We have to believe in a hero's mission, and once we do, we'll gladly stick around to see how the hero can overcome. The best video games, which now draw more of our money and attention than books and movies, are also programmed around quest stories. You, an ordinary soul, plucked from obscurity having been entrusted with defending the Earth from an alien invasion. Conveniently, you've been supplied with a rocket launcher and a rechargeable health pack. You, a mere plumber with a stubborn disposition and an especially hard head, must rescue the princess from the castle. Oh, this is the wrong castle? I guess you'll have to keep going. Most of these quest stories are told over and over in different ways, often with a fair amount of exaggeration. They can be engaging stories, but for the most part, they aren't real. We enjoy them because for a brief time, we have the power to alter our belief in what's possible. Maybe there really is an alien invasion. Maybe there really is a holy grail somewhere out there just waiting to be discovered. As I wandered the planet, spending years journeying to nearly 200 countries, I discovered something important. I loved the travel, and everywhere I went, I had an interesting, had something interesting to offer. My worldview was broadened as I encountered different ways of life and learned from people in other cultures. But equally fascinating was that I wasn't the only one on a quest. All over the world, people had discovered the same way of bringing greater purpose to their life. Some had been toiling away at a goal for years without any recognition. Going for it, whatever it was, was simply something they found meaningful and loved to do. I want to make my, my life worthwhile, one woman said. I consider myself an instrument, and if I don't put myself to work for the greatest possible good, 
I feel like I wasted a chance that will never return. Some of the people I talked to were pursuing quests that involved extended world journeys like mine. I met strangers and new friends who walked, biked, or otherwise traveled across entire countries or continents. In Istanbul, for example, I met Matt Kraus, a financial analyst from Seattle. Matt had traveled to Turkey with the intention of walking all the way to Iran, meeting strangers along the way, and understanding a different way of life. At first it was just a crazy idea, he said. But then it stuck with him, becoming something he knew he'd regret if he didn't see it through. Lesson, beware of crazy ideas. Meanwhile, other quests were about mastery or collection. A Boy Scout earned every merit badge, 154, by the age of 15. A middle-aged woman devoted the rest of her life to seeing every poss possible species a bird. As she explained in her journal, what started as a hobby turned into an obsession after receiving a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Some people's quests were distinctly private. A teenager from the Netherlands set out to sail the open sea, becoming the youngest person in history to successfully circumnavigate the world's oceans alone. The publicity she received from the record-setting adventure was often critical and largely unwelcome. But receiving attention, whether positive or negative, wasn't the point. I did this for myself, she told me, after she'd finished, not for anyone else. Others join, chose to join forces, including a family of four who set out to bicycle 17,300 miles from Alaska to Argentina, building a dream together along the way. Also feeling wonderless was, the young, was a young couple who visited every basilica in the United States, hoping to better understand their faith. Much of the time, the quest was something physical, a mountain to climb, the open sea to traverse, the visa processing office to persuade. But what these strivers were searching for usually went beyond the, the stated task. Matt Krauss, the financial analyst who set out to walk the entire length of, your, of rural Turkey, reflected on the life he'd known back in America. It wasn't just that he was now in another country, he said later. It felt the, as though he'd opened a path to another life. Out there on his own, walking mile after mile along the dusty village ro roads, meeting strangers who became friends, he felt a heightened sense of being alive. Something about these people I met stood out. They spoke with intensity. They were focused on their goals, even if they didn't immediately make sense to others. I wanted to understand why they'd chosen to pursue big goals with such determination. Were they driven by the same urges as I was, or ones that were completely different? And I wanted to learn what kept them going when others would have stopped. I had a strong sense that these people could teach critical lessons. Parker J. Palmer, in his book, The Act of Life, in speaking about the hidden wholeness, said, for example, if I allow my life to be deformed by the fallen angel called fear of failure, I will never be fully alive. I will withhold myself from actions that will fail or ignore evidence of failure when it happens. But if I could ride that fear all the way down, I might break out of my self-imposed isolation and become connected with many other lives. Because failure and the fear of it is universal. I would learn that failure is a natural fact, a way of discerning what to try next. I would be empowered to take more risks, which means to embrace more life. And in the process, I would become more connected with others. The monster called fear of failure, or ridicule, or criticism, or foolishness, or any of the other fears that are so easy to regard as mortal enemies, would become a demanding but empowering guide towards relatedness. But on this side of such an experience, we, we may wonder why we should go anywhere near the monsters, let alone ride them all the way down. After all, they are monsters, and they do harbor powers of destruction as well as of creativity. 
even if riding the monsters is the only way to reach safe ground. There is no guarantee that we will get there. People have fallen off before the end of the journey and have been stranded in some bad places. So why take the risk of riding the monsters in the first place? My own experience offers a small parable to answer that question. It happened several years ago in the Outdoor and Challenge program called Outward Bound. I took the course in my early 40s, a time of life when monsters abound. And in the middle of that course, I was asked to confront the thing I had feared most since I had first heard about Outward Bound. The gossamer strand was hooked to a harness around my body. I was backed up to the top of a 110-foot cliff, and I was told to lean out over God's own emptiness and walk down the face of that cliff to the ground 11 stories down. I remember the cliff too well. It started with a 5-foot drop to a small ledge, then a 10-foot drop to another ledge, then a third and final drop all the way down. I tried to negotiate the first drop, my feet instantly went out from under me, and I fell heavily to the first ledge. I don't think you quite have it yet, the instructor observed astutely. You are leaning too close to the rock face. You need to lean much further back so your feet will grip the wall. That advice, like the advice of some spiritual traditions, went against my very instinct. Surely one should hug the wall, not lean out over the void. But on the second drop, I tried to lean back better, but not far enough, and I hit the second ledge with a thud, not unlike the first. You still don't have it, said the ever-observant instructor. Try again. Since my first try would be, my next try would be the last one, her counsel was not especially comforting. But try I did, and much to my amazement, I found myself slowly moving down the rock wall. Step by step, I made my way with growing confidence until about halfway down, I suddenly realized that I was not heading toward a very large hole in the rock, and, not knowing anything better to do, I froze. The instructor waited a small eternity for me to thaw out, and when she realized that I was showing no signs of life, she yelled up, Is anything wrong, Parker? As if she needed to ask. To this day, I do not know the source of the childlike voice that came up from within me. But my response is a matter of public record. I don't want to talk about it. The instructor yelled back, Then I think it's time you learned the outward bound motto. Wonderful, I thought. I'm about to die and she's feeding me cliches. But then she spoke words I have never forgotten. Words so true that they empower me to negotiate the rest of that cliff without incident. If you can't get out of it, get into it. Bone deep, I knew there was no way out of the situation except to go deeper into it. And with that knowledge, my feet began to move. That is why we must sometimes ride the monsters all the way down. Sometimes... Some monsters simply will not go away. They are too big to walk around, too powerful to overcome, too clever to outsmart. The only way to deal with them is to move toward them, with them, into them, through them. We must learn to befriend some of these primitive powers that seem so much like enemies. And in the process, we find them working for us, not against us working for life and not for death. When we live a full life of contemplation and action, the monsters will always be aroused and we will be compelled to search the depths. It is good to know that those very monsters can take us to the depths we need to explore. It is even better to know that in those depths, we can find the hidden wholeness that unites and energizes us the source and the power that make us fully alive. A few years back, I interviewed an artist named Beth Stone, and I documented the interview in my book, Your Creative Peace, Finding and Deepening Your Creative Voice While Communing with God. 
Here's an excerpt from that interview. Beth Stone Studio. She has many inter in influences. Her family. She says, I grew up in a creative environment. Both my parents and my brother and I were always making something. C.S. Lewis. She says, his book sparked my imagination. Francis Schaeffer. He made me realize the power of art to express ideas and worldview. Jenny Wall, a dear friend and the lady who introduced me to the wonderful world of watercolor. Janine Zaklis, her work and blog have been a huge influence on my work and business. Preferred medium of creativity at the time, she said, I'm really enjoying watercolors and collage. However, I also work in oils and acrylics. Each medium has its own strengths and weaknesses. I enjoy the variety and challenge of working with them all. Here's her bio. 30-year-old wife to Josh, mom to furry grouch named Harvey, daughter, sister, aunt, friend, artist, crafter, do-it-yourselfer, aspiring garden, gardener, avid reader, collector of too many hobbies, photographer, neat fleet, freak, Blogger, lover of rowboats, and valiant mice, sinner saved by grace. Beth Stone, specializing in watercolors, oils, acrylics, mixed media, and custom murals, was born in Johnson City, Tennessee. She graduated valedictorian from Milligan Co College in 2003 with a Bachelor's of Art in English and minors in photography and journalism. She is primarily self-taught in the arts, with the exception of a few college classes and independent workshops. She currently resides in Greenfield, Tennessee with her husband, Josh. Her primary goal, both in her artwork and her life, is to glorify her creator by conveying his truth and beauty to a dark world. What is one of your earliest creative memories? Once, when I was probably about five or six, I spent the day writing my own newspaper and then making a, a newspaper stand for it out of a cardboard box. I decided that day that I should make something created every single day. I haven't followed through quite every day since then, but I do make it a point to pursue creativity in my daily life. What, how did you find your creative voice? Well, first of all, I try to stick to the guidelines in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on those things. After that, my goal is to create beautiful, inspiring, and thought-provoking work. I've gotten lots of inspiration from other wonderful artists and writers, but I've also inspired by nature, books I read, music, theology, people I know. Inspiration is all around if you're looking for it. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life? Creativity has always been a big part of my life. My parents homeschooled my brother and me, and that gave us the freedom to pursue a lot of different interests and hobbies while we were growing up. When I was in college, most of the time was taken up by my studies. However, I did manage to squeeze in a few art and photography classes, which was a nice creative outlet during that time. After graduating, I continued to pursue my interests in art. I discovered the blogosphere and created my first fledgling blog featuring some of my artwork. Then I got a request to paint a mural for a friend's child's room and suddenly my business was born. Since then I branched out into a new blog, an Etsy shop, and an occasional art show. I have a small studio set up in my apartment and I'm always in the middle of some project or other. If you had a creative hiatus, what event circumstance brought you back to your creative lifestyle? Like most artists, I do suffer from the occasional dry spell. Last year was a very stressful period in our lives. My husband was gone for seven months taking care of a very dear friend who was ill and eventually died of cancer. I was working at another job nearly full time. We were making some major life changes which involved my husband going back to school. 
it was a hard time personally, and that drained a lot of my creative energy. During times like that, I've learned it's best to just roll with it and wait it out. The inspiration returns eventually. In the meantime, I find other creative outlets like knitting, sewing, gardening, reading, writing, or simply keeping my house presentable. How has God been a part of your creative process? My faith is the foundation for my entire worldview, and thus all of my work comes out of that influence. Because we are created in the image of God and God is creative, we have the gift of creativity in ourselves and we are to use it for his glory. That's my goal in every piece I create. Is there a particular moment where your creativity became infused with your spiritual practice? I've always wanted my work to be used to glorify God. However, writing a blog has be really opened my eyes to the potential influence of both my artwork and my words. It's easy to feel like you're writing to avoid when you write a post on the web. But when you start getting com comments from complete strangers all over the world, it's a bit of a wake-up call. I've been contacted by readers who are believers, who have been encouraged and blessed by seeing my work, as well as by unbelievers who have stumbled across my site. One reader, an unbeliever, wrote to me and said, Your work has a beauty and vibrancy to it that one doesn't often see in the art world these days. Does that come from your Christian faith? That question opened the door for me to share the gospel with that person. Ever since that time, I've been much more aware that my work and words have the potential to influence people for eternity. And I'm doing my best to take that responsibility seriously and represent Christ faithfully. We are all stewards, stewards of the gifts we've been given. That fact is both humbling and exciting. Is there one particular thing that you do that ushers you into a place of worship? I can think of several things that do this. Being outside, enjoying God's creation, singing along with my favorite hymns, discovering new things each and every day or each and every time that I open the Bible. One habit I've developed over the last year or so is keeping a journal, both on paper and on my blog, of things for which I am thankful. I came across the idea at Ann Voskamp's blog, where there's a whole community of people who are committing to write down 1,000 gifts or 1,000 blessings they've seen in their lives from God. I'm on 400 and something now on my own list. And so far, it's been one of the best spiritual dis disciplines I've ever practiced. When you start looking for blessings, you discover more and more of them all around you. God is so good. Being constantly aware of that has really helped me to develop an attitude of faithfulness and contentment in whatever circumstances.